Hello and welcome to another episode of Twimmel Talk, the podcast where I interview interesting people doing interesting things in machine learning and artificial intelligence. I'm your host, Sam Charrington. This week on the podcast, we're featuring a series of conversations from the NIPS conference in Long Beach, California. This was my first time at NIPS and I had a great time there. I attended a bunch of talks and of course learned a ton. I organized an impromptu roundtable on building AI products and I met a bunch of wonderful people, including some former Twimmel Talk guests. I'll be sharing a bit more about my experiences at NIPS via my newsletter, which you should take a second right now to subscribe to at twimmelai.com slash newsletter. This week, through the end of the year, we're running a special listener appreciation contest to celebrate hitting 1 million listens on the podcast and to thank you all for being so awesome. Tweet to us using the hashtag Twimmel1Mil to enter. Everyone who enters is a winner and we're giving away a bunch of cool Twimmel swag and other mystery prizes. If you're not on Twitter or want more ways to enter, visit twimmelaicom slash Twimmel1Mil for the full rundown. Before we dive in, I'd like to thank our friends over at Intel Nirvana for their sponsorship of this podcast and our NIPS series. While Intel was very active at NIPS with a bunch of workshops, demonstrations, and poster sessions, their big news this time was the first public viewing of the Intel Nirvana Neural Network Processor, or NNP. The goal of the NNP architecture is to provide the flexibility needed to support deep learning primitives while making the core hardware components as efficient as possible, giving neural network designers powerful tools for solving larger and more difficult problems while minimizing data movement and maximizing data reuse. To learn more about Intel's AI products group and the Intel Nirvana NNP, visit intelnirvana.com. This time around, I'm joined by Matthew Crosby, a researcher at Imperial College London, working on the Kinds of Intelligence Project. Matthew joined me after the NIP Symposium of the same name, an event that brought researchers from a variety of disciplines together towards three aims— a broader perspective on the possible types of intelligence beyond human intelligence, better measurements of intelligence, and a more purposeful analysis of where progress should be made in AI to best benefit society. Matthew's research explores intelligence from a philosophical perspective, exploring ideas like predictive processing and controlled hallucination, and how these theories of intelligence impact the way we approach creating artificial intelligence. This was a very interesting conversation and one that I'm sure you'll get a kick out of. And now, on to the show. All right, everyone, I am here in Long Beach, California at the NIPS conference, and I have the pleasure of being joined by Matthew Crosby, research associate at Imperial College, London. Matthew, welcome to the podcast. Thank you very much. So why don't we get started by having you tell us a little bit about your background and how you got involved in AI. So I was always very, very interested in intelligence okay. as a concept. And I had a fairly mathematical sort of upbringing and start. And so my first thought was, oh, I'm going to explore intelligence through mathematics and computer science. Okay. And so I worked for a while in high-level planning in, in AI. And over the course of the time working on that, Stuff, I sort of got a bit disillusioned with the fact that AI was less about intelligence than I was hoping it would be. Because for me, <laughs> intelligence always spoke in some sense to human-like intelligence, to this, okay. to this ability to sort of experience the world and plan in the world. That's why I was working in, in planning. But to form ideas about what you're going to do and represent this like picture of the world in front of you. And that was a fundamental part of intelligence. And no, just, we're not quite there yet. Well, it wasn't being covered in, in the part of the field that I was working on. Okay. And then as I was sort of becoming a bit disillusioned with that, I found these theories in philosophy, which I'd been dabbling in, which suddenly spoke to what I felt, you know, my experience of the world was like and what intelligence actually was. And it was the first time when I thought, no, people are actually explaining this at a level where it's making sense to me and it's progressing us further towards a better understanding. Okay. So I just completely transitioned, went back and relearned philosophy so that I could 
uh, understand these theories and philosophy of mind better. And while I was doing that, we were seeing all these advances now in neural networks and in deep learning and machine learning where we are actually approaching something that looks like intelligence in a way that we can talk about, especially philosophically, that's interesting and like makes sense and does speak to what I was interested in, in terms of intelligence. So now after making this transition to philosophy, I'm back in a sort of partial role in between the two, where <laughs> I'm looking at intelligence in AI, but from a more philosophical perspective. Mm. And so how does that translate into a research path for you? Well, I mean, one of the problems with that is that's obviously a giant research <laughs> project. And so the, but the project I'm on right now is the Kinds of Intelligence Project, okay. which is a sub-project at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence. Okay. This is a large, like, 10 million pound project in the UK, mainly based at Cambridge, where the idea is to take people from multiple disciplines mm -hmm. and look at the future of intelligence and the path we're on towards the future of intelligence and take expertise from AI, but also from philosophy, political science, mm -hmm. literature, and all the, all the broad range of subjects that could have something to say about intelligence okay. and use it to shape research in the future, shape policy decisions, and make sure that we are moving towards a future that's best for everyone in terms of intelligence. Mm. The Kinds of Intelligence is also the name of a symposium that you co-organize here at NIPS. Tell us a little bit about that and the goals for it. So the goals of the Kinds of Intelligence project are to map this space of intelligence so yeah. that we can better understand the intelligence landscape. And the Kinds of Intelligence Symposium at NIPS, the idea was to bring a lot of people who are at the forefront of different types of intelligence together into the same place. And so we can have this conversation and look at the way the intelligence land landscape is shaped, both from plant cognition to animal cognition to child development, which are all very important parts of understanding intelligence, mm -hmm. to obviously being at NIPS, AI and machine learning and the type of intelligence we can now create. We, we had people talking like Demis Hassabis from, from DeepMind, who's talking about AlphaZero, which is now solving Go and chess and shogi at levels way beyond human, human intelligence. And but we also had people talking about plant cognition and the way if you drop certain plants from a height over time, they can learn a response to curl up in protection from falling on the floor. You drop them enough times, eventually they learn to anticipate what is going to happen and curl up ahead of time. Oh, wow. So this is a form of learning that doesn't have any neurons involved and it's very alien to the type of learning that we right. generally think about. Huh. Interesting. And so your personal kind of slice through this is from a philosophical perspective. And you mentioned some kind of a, a body of work or research within uh, philosophy that you stumbled across. Yes. You know, what is that? So the general term for this is predictive processing. And okay. it's the idea that when we take in sensory data from the world, we have this huge jumble of messy information coming into the system, mm -hmm. right? We have 130 million or so photoreceptors in each eye, all transducing electromagnetic information. And somehow the brain has to make sense of that and understand right. it. And at some point, it understands it in a way that we sort of experience the world. And that's, right. that's, that's how that happens. But the old, sort of very old view was that this information comes into the system and in a very bottom-up way gets pieced together, more and more and more complicated as it goes up right. through the system. And eventually you get ideas such as tables and chairs and you know, the kind of objects that we feel like that we see. Predictive processing idea sort of turns that on its head and says, we're not in the process of sort of taking these components of information and putting them together. We're actively trying to work out what we're going to experience. We're predicting the incoming sensory information and actively doing so. We're always trying to work out what's going to happen next in the world. And by, by turning it that way around and looking at how we could actively predict, we see that our experience of the world takes the form of what Anil Seth has called a controlled hallucination. And this phrase is becoming much more, <laughs> much more popular nowadays. So the idea is in a hallucination, you're just making stuff up, right? Maybe your brain right, is making right. stuff up that's not really there, and that's what you see, right? In a controlled hallucination, you're making stuff up just as you were in a real hallucination, but it's controlled by the actual sensory data itself. Mm -hmm. So there's no real difference from me seeing this table in front of me right now to hallucinating one, except for the fact that there's a ground truth from the sensory data that is binding it together, so that hopefully when I see a table there, from your perspective, you're also seeing a similar table. Mm. So what are the implications of seeing, you know, seeing cognition as this controlled hallucination process? There's a 
huge number of implications from this. And I think that's one of the beauties of the theory and probably one of the potential downfalls of the theory too, is that it can apply at so many different levels across the brain. And also in relation to m machine learning, we're seeing obviously a huge focus on predictive algorithms and on generative models, which right. are generating predictions about, about the world or the sensory data or the data that they're being input. So we can think of this as like a very low level, like in the retina at the back of the eye, we're doing what is called predictive coding, which mm -hmm. is whenever I get, say, a particular rod cell is hit by electromagnetic radi radiation, it has the amount of information of the intensity of the light that it can transfer up further in the brain. Right. That's a, it could be a large number of different values that this takes. But if instead of transferring that value, I look at what I would expect just by looking locally at all the values of the rod cells or the cone cells around me, mm -hmm. I can take the average of that and see how much that particular cell is different from that average, then you'll get a much smaller number, which increases the bandwidth that you, you well, decreases the bandwidth that you need to use to send the same amount of information. And so are you describing... Uh theory of what is actually hap happening physiologically or are yes. you describing a modeling approach or so, so that's this is it sounds so like the neighbor point, happening in the eyes or something a, a bit like that yes but so i was starting at the point where this is actually yes we know this is happening at okay. a neurophysiological level and i was going to move on to the complete other side where this approach can be applied to beliefs and desires and okay we're our beliefs and desires are updated in a similar sort of predictive format mm -hmm. but before I move on, one thing with this predictive coding approach to the retina is if you look at it, it is very much like convolutions that we're seeing in machine learning. Mm -hmm. And the way they work is, is a very sort of similar approach. They're obviously a bit more focused on invariance in the visual field and how we could apply the same math at different locations, which is another area of this. But they could also be used to do a similar approach to predicting local variations and only transmitting information about that variation as opposed to the, the raw data itself. Mm -hmm. So that's one level of it. But at the other level, we have the idea that our beliefs are updated in a similar way. And our high level understanding of the world is based on these predictions that we're making. Mm -hmm. And comparing to the data coming in, and when it's wrong, we have two choices, we either update our prediction, and ch therefore change our model of the world mm -hmm. and see the world differently. Or we act in the world and move around the world. And that might make our prediction that was wrong, turn into a prediction that was correct. Hmm. So, for example, if I predict that table is off to my right, mm -hmm. there's two ways I can make that true. Well, I can turn, I can change my prediction. I can be, no, it's wrong, it's to my left, and then update it that way. Or I could move my head. And that would make the same, another way of making the same prediction right. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a way that we could bring actions and interacting with the world into our understanding, in, especially in machine learning and robotics, mm -hmm. of how we can incorporate this sort of predictive approach to the whole brain or the whole way of modeling the world into a system that's not just understanding the world, but also acting in it and performing tasks and therefore being intelligent, hopefully. Hmm. Is your research kind of approaching this from a theoretical perspective exclusively or are there, is it there an experimental element or applied element as well? So I have been running experiments with predictive coding style neural network. Okay. We've seen a few coming out recently based on this structure where you have a hierarchical generative network and each layer of the hierarchy is just trying to predict anything that the lower layers have so far failed to predict. Hmm. So the first layer tries to predict the world, but it doesn't, it, it's not strong enough by itself to fully model everything. So then what it can't predict Can you moves give an up example to the next of layer. Kind of the experiment, like how, what, it, what specifically is it trying to predict? So there's been work on this in experiments from video data from car images. So you okay. put for videos on top of a car moving around, driving around. Okay. You give it the first nine frames and ask it to predict the tenth. Mm -hmm. And then you can get fairly good results at predicting you know, how the road is going to have moved and the things that will have come into view. Okay. Uh, I've been experimenting with this in maze-like three-dimensional domains, working on the raw pixel inputs and predicting how the maze is going to update or how, how the pixels are going to update as I move around this maze. Okay. I spoke with a, a researcher working on something very similar. Like she was looking at it from the perspective of like embodied computer vision. So right. not just fixed frames, but, you know, fixed frames plus the ability to, to move the orientation of the, 
the viewport, if you will. And one of the sets of experiments or, or use cases was this kind of sensor mounted on a car that was changing yeah, yeah. direction and trying to do the prediction, things like that. Yeah, yeah. Interesting. And so and so you've got this this scenario with, you know, let's take the video case. You've got the scenario where the you've got the camera on the vehicle and you're trying to predict ahead. How does that then tie into this hierarchical structure that you were describing? Well, the idea of the hierarchy is that you'll have the first layer of your of your network would be not have enough potential space inside it to fully predict everything that's going on. There's just not enough space to represent the full function of the mapping of the change of the inputs over time. Mm -hmm. So then anything that it can predict, you're not interested in that anymore because that's solved, that's done. Mm -hmm. that, that That gets sort of finished at that layer of the system. Mm-hmm. But anything that it doesn't get predicted, this is called the, the prediction error, will mm-hmm. get sent up to the next layer of the system. And this is the, if everything's working as intended, this is the parts that are a bit more complex than could be predicted just really easily. Like, mm-hmm. you know, something, this pixel change always stays the same, so I'm just going to predict it stays the same. But then something slowly moving across the visual field or the, the input space in this video might be impossible to predict at that lower level. But at a higher level, once you've removed the easy stuff, and you've got access to more machinery because you're layers deep into the system, you might be able to predict that. And the idea is that as you move up the hierarchy, you'll get more high-level representations of elements of the world that are changing. So the low level would be very simple stuff. The high level could potentially be things changing you know, very slowly over time or changing you know, more modeling like the intuitive physics going on behind the domain that you might expect, oh, this object's hitting something, so now it's going to change direction. Mm-hmm the lower level might think, oh, it's just going to continue going on in the same direction. And then when it gets that wrong, the higher level, which hopefully has representation of the physics, will be able to correct for that and say, no, this is, this is how it's going to change. So what you're describing sounds like, it sounds like what I think of a, you know, as a, a, maybe a very deep convolution on that, yes. right? That's going to figure out different things at different levels. Yeah. How is it different? Or are you doing things to kind of force it to learn certain aspects in certain layers or? Yes, yeah, so I think the beauty of the research is that it, at one level you could think of it as just as a very deep convolutional net. Mm-hmm. But the one thing that is different is, is you're focusing on, on this particular prediction paradigm, which has its own nice properties to it. So for example, if I, if I give you a noisy input, so if the video is full of noise right. and I'm trying to predict the next frame in, in a noisy video, yeah. if the noise is unbiased, so that over time the average of the noise is zero, then the prediction automatically filters that out at the very bottom layer of the structure. And that doesn't get passed up to the higher levels. So they see less noisy input. Hmm. So you get powerful results just from moving to this prediction paradigm. And also the second thing that is different is the main propagation from layer to layer is the errors of the stuff that you can't predict. Right. As opposed to just a more sort of complex combination of everything you've got so far. Does that result in a network that is, you know, that has kind of fundamental differences in properties than what you might see in a typical CNN, like in terms of the density of the weights or the, you know, the, the way the layers are interconnected with one another? Yeah, I think so far, I mean, the research is fairly early here and there will be, I don't really know the answer to that question. So the answer is going to be yes, but I can tell you in, <laughs> in good details exactly you know, how this approach differs from the others. And I think the, the more you incorporate from different areas in, in machine learning techniques, the more you're going to find that this approach looks like all the others. Right, right. And the, the layers are, are trained end-to-end. You're not training the individual layer separately. Is you that can correct? train the individual layer separately because each layer's input is just the error coming the error up from, from the, the layer. Previous. Layer. Right, okay. And so when you, you said you acknowledge it's early, have you had any preliminary results from, from this so line pre- of research? Preliminary results are that the, the idea works. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and the suggestion there is that if this is a good philosophical theory of how the brain might be working, mm-hmm. and then when we do implement this, it'll, it'll, it'll you know, actually implement it in your networks, we, we, we see positive results. Mm-hmm. But that's just a sort of a backup like result to say, yeah, maybe the philosophical theory is onto something, right? Maybe this is a good idea. So it it can predict future frames with high accuracy, you know, just when moving around a domain. But it, it's still early days to say how well that will be when we move it into reinforcement learning type of experiments where we can compare to state of the art and say mm-hmm. and see how that learning that kind of representation helps. Hmm. 
Yeah, the impression that, that I get from the the conversations I've had recently on this and related topics is that the you know our understanding of the the brain and the neurophysiology and our understanding of the machine learning are you know we, we're kind of one leapfrogs the other and then yeah. and feeds back you know learnings to the other and it's kind of this you know iterative process is is that your sense as well or is one area like you know far ahead of the other and you know you know for example we understand the brain a lot more than we do the you know the machine learning side and machine learning continues to pull from that or the other way around or I think we understand them in very, very different ways, but there are a lot of people that are sort of on the cusp of between the two disciplines that are uh-huh. grabbing stuff from one and pulling it into the other and grabbing stuff the other in the other direction. And we've seen that work, like convolutions, as I mentioned before, mm-hmm. are across these two disciplines and they work on, on both sides of the spectrum. And, and which side did they come from? Do you well, know? I, I think it depends on your <laughs> viewpoint. So I was at the symposium, Gary Marcus was saying that perhaps Jan LeCun wasn't aware of all the predictive coding type work in the retina and how convolutions might be applied in low level visual systems. Okay. And he was just trying stuff and found something that worked that happens to be very, very much related. Okay. But yeah, I think that depends who you ask. Okay. <laughs> interesting. Interesting. So... You also mentioned earlier in the kind of the conversation of philosophy, theory of mind more broadly. Can you describe that and, and how that fits into all of this? Yeah, so at first my my intuitions about why intelligence was in, is interesting mm-hmm. are that it involves introspection and thoughts and the ability to reason about the world in, in the way we do, which is in a sense in a, a sort of symbolic process, right? We, yeah. we construct sentences, we have language, that's obviously a very key component. We construct sentences in our heads and we understand things through those sentences sometimes. And it's really interesting to see how like modern work is starting to look at representations of the world that in machine learning where we can answer questions in natural languages applied to images. For example, we've seen relation nets where you take in an image containing you know, a few objects of different sizes and different locations, and you answer a natural language question such as, is the red ob- object to the left of the yellow object? That right. kind of question. And the, the way they work is, is, is to try and create a representation inside the network that understands this relational kind of information, mm-hmm. which is moving towards, in, in my opinion, like moving towards a more symbolic or at least potential for a symbolic understanding of the world inside the standard machine learning algorithm. Mm. My reaction to that from very little kind of reading in linguistics is that that like part of that's not the the idea of, you know, thinking in sentences is not universally accepted. Is that right? Mm -hmm. Like it's, you know, in a lot of ways thought is more abstract than than sentences. There are experiments about trying to remember the. You know, there's this this line of thinking around, you know, whether the degree to which language impacts thought and yeah. you know i think there's kind of this popular belief that you know people think in their languages but it's also been disproven in, in a lot of ways yeah I, I don't know too much about that area okay. to be honest but i do think that some kind of not necessarily language type processing but symbolic level processing or processing where we understand objects as entities that persist over time that we can therefore then label is going to be necessary as we move towards more general types of intelligence, especially mm-hmm. if we end up on this track where it seems, at least there's a f- lot of key players in the field right now pulling towards human-like general intelligence, mm-hmm. that that's going to be yeah, a key component. And I think as we move towards it in, in AI and machine learning, we will be able to answer those questions better. But for now, yeah, I'm not really sure. Mm-hmm. What's kind of the future of your particular research, both from the philosophical side as well as the machine learning side? Yeah, so we actually ended up talking about a sort of fairly small part of the research I've been doing, okay. which I think doesn't really necessarily well, well, apply to answer let's that dive, question. Let's dive further into your research. Okay, and... so, so, so one thing Subin said at the, at the symposium was that maybe at the moment we're at a pre-Copernican revolution for our understanding of intelligence. Mm. So obviously in the Copernican revolution, we went from having humans at the center of the universe right. with everything revolving around it to humans as... No, no longer at the center. Hmm. And our understanding of intelligence seems very human-centric at the moment, or at least the, the lay person or the, the everyday understanding of hmm. intelligence. And we're seeing a sort of move away from this with these you know, ideas of plant cognition and also these ideas of AI systems where 
as Demis was saying at the symposium, Alpha Zero playing chess played a very alien type of chess to him. It wasn't a human-like way of playing. It was, it was a new type of playing. And so when we explore this intelligence landscape, humans are going to be a very, very, very tiny part of that giant landscape. Hmm. And with AI, because everything is artificial, we have the ability to explore way beyond the scope of this little area that, well, there's a very tiny area that biological life potentially exists in this landscape, and there's an mm. even smaller area that human life exists in this mm. landscape. But my particular interest, and I think the big question moving forward for AI is, when will we create intelligences and what type of intelligences have some kind of moral patience? Have some kind of... Some kind of what? Moral patience. So they are okay. patients in our moral understanding of them. So they, they can, it can be ethically correct or wrong to put them in certain situations. Mm -hmm. So for example, Nick Bostrom has this term, the mind crime, where potentially we could create conscious artificial entities into a, some kind of slavery because they're just doing tasks for us. Or we could create entities that just live a life of suffering because they're never achieving their goals. And it actually means something to say that they are suffering. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to explore this space of intelligence and compare it to the space of possible minds. Mm -hmm. The type of intelligence is, not all intelligence is, our minds. We, we, we know that. That seems obvious. But some of them are. And we don't know right now whether it's just this little tiny, and it seems absurd, you know, it would be very pre-Copernican to say it's just this little human dot that is the, the space of possible minds, where we need to map that onto the space of possible intelligences. So I see that as the broad research goal that's most important. Mm -hmm. So beyond the, the tiny piece of it, we discover what are some of the other kind of concrete research areas within that broad umbrella? So I think that the, well, the most concrete question, at least for me, is uh -huh. how can we understand intelligence in a way where we can then say about certain agents that are intelligent, whether or not they have a mind? Mm. But obviously that itself is a massively huge question, and it's going to take results from philosophy, from neuroscience, to get to the human understanding of like, we know humans have minds, mm -hmm. so we can learn about minds from them. And then from AI and from a completely other side of the field to, to let, think about what different types of alien intelligences or artificial intelligences could have minds. Do we even have a functional definition of mind? We don't even have a functional definition <laughs> of intelligence. That was, one of the, mind. that was one of the great sort of results I thought of the symposium was we've invited all these people together to talk about intelligence in different ways. Mm -hmm. And they've brought their, their own expertise. But that expertise each comes with its own assumptions about what intelligence is. Mm. And we even had this debate there with Alpha Zero now playing Go and chess better than humans. If I told you oh, I have a friend and he's a really great chess player, mm -hmm. you'd automatically think he's intelligent. Mm -hmm. But now there's people saying, oh, Alpha Zero is not intelligent. Chess is easy. Mm -hmm. Which, I mean, there's not even an agreement on that front of, right, whether, right, of right. what intelligence is. So, so yeah, so... Minds is going to be harder than intelligence, and we haven't solved <laughs> intelligence yet. <laughs> From the various folks involved in the symposium, are there are there like patterns in the way they define intelligence that are easy to characterize? Like, is there? I, I think so. Yeah. So like there's the a, Pedro Domingo's tribes of you know AI. Is is there an intelligence version of that? Yeah, because I, I think there's there's definitely a camp that's very interested in human like intelligence, mm -hmm. and what they tend to do is define intelligence in terms of human intelligence. And then automatically assume that AGI, as we move to more general intelligence, is going to be on a path towards human-like intelligence, mm -hmm. because that's the type they're very, very interested mm -hmm. in. And then the, on the other side of the spectrum, you've got this idea that intelligence is so much more broad than as humans we could possibly imagine. Uh -huh. So I think you have these sort of two separate camps. Okay. Interesting. And so maybe going kind of circling back to you know, the future and kind mm -hmm. of how you push all this forward, how are you thinking about that today? Having um, just finished your, you know, pulling together the symposium and bringing together some of the, the, you know, folks that are kind of pushing this research forward. So I'm thinking that it's never too early to start these asking these questions. Uh -huh. It may be too early to expect to have concrete answers to these questions, mm -hmm. but it's definitely the time that we can actually bring these different types of people together to have this conversation. Because uh -huh. although everyone has different understandings of inter intelligence, we're getting results in these different fields that are comparable. And we can start comparing them and talking about the, the issue. So my feeling is very optimistic that this is the important and right area that we should be working on and that we are going to get results now that we're at a, a state where AI, you know, 
is as advanced as it is, mm -hmm. and our understanding of intelligence across the animal kingdom is is, is that it is that we can we can start bringing these together. Mm -hmm. Awesome, awesome. Well, Matt, thanks so much for taking the time to chat with me about what you're up to. I wish I had an opportunity to attend the symposium. It sounds excellent, and I know that you had some really excellent speakers and participants. So I'm looking forward to keeping up with the work of the group. Thank, Thank you. Sir. Thank you. All right, everyone, that's our show for today. Thanks so much for listening and for your continued feedback and support. For more information on Matthew or any of the topics covered in this episode, head on over to twimlai.com slash talk slash 91. To follow along with the NIP series, visit twimlai.com slash NIPS 2017. To enter our Twimmel One Mill contest, visit twimlai.com slash twimmel one mill. Of course, we'd be delighted to hear from you either via a comment on the show notes page or via a tweet to at twimlai or at Sam Charrington. Thanks once again to Intel Nirvana for their sponsorship of this series. To learn more about the Intel Nirvana NNP and the other things Intel's been up to in the AI arena, visit intelnirvana.com. As I mentioned a few weeks back, this will be our final series of shows for the year. So take your time and take it all in and get caught up on any of the old pods you've been saving up. Happy holidays and happy new year. See you in 2018. And of course, thanks once again for listening and catch you next time.